Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you all for joining today's panel event on pre-arrest jail diversion programs. Uh, my name is Allison Robertson, and I'm an associate professor in psychiatry and behavioral sciences here at Duke, and a faculty member of the Behavioral Health Corps in the Wilson Center for Science and Justice at Duke Law School. As a member of the Behavioral Health Corps, our group's work focuses on the intersection of behavioral health disorders and criminal justice involvement. We study programs, policies, and services that aim to divert people with mental health and or substance use problems away from the criminal justice system and instead connect them to care. Law Enforcement Assisted Diversion, or LEAD, is an innovative program that aims to do just that for people in the community who use drugs. Our group is conducting a multi-site evaluation of North Carolina LEAD programs to learn about program process, outcomes, and effectiveness. Today, we will hear from three lead experts who have direct involvement with frontline programming, both nationally and in North Carolina. I'm also very pleased to introduce my co-moderator today, Melissa Larson, who is the Law Enforcement Programs Manager with North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition. Melissa and NCHRC have been instrumental in implementing lead programs around North Carolina over the last five years. Uh, to get started, um, with our wonderful panel, um, uh, three panelists, I'd like to have each of you introduce yourself, your role in lead programming, and how you became interested in helping people with substance use disorders. Lisa, would you like to start? Sure, thank you so much, uh, Allison. It's really a pleasure to be um, here with you all. I am normally in Seattle, although today I find myself in North Carolina because I'm attending the wedding of the director of the LEAD National Support Bureau uh, this afternoon. So good to really be with you. Um, I, am, I am the director at the Public Defender Association in Seattle, um, and I came to this work as a public defender. We launched the flagship uh, LEAD program almost 10 years ago <clears throat> after years of <clears throat> struggle and um, you know, controversy over the best way to tackle um, issues of uh, um, crime related to drugs. There was growing consensus that, um, that those problems were not well addressed through the traditional criminal legal system, as well in Seattle, as in many communities, um, the brunt of that approach fell heavily disproportionately on the black community. And yet, while we at my office and many others were critical of that, that reality, many in the community, including many um, families uh, affected by that state of affairs, asked that instead of just sort of, you know, um, diminishing the war on drugs, we also build up positive investments so that people could get care. Um, and we didn't just back away from the related problems. So LEAD was born from that realization that we needed to both make a shift and in so doing um, actually increase the level of attention that these problems received. And since then, we've not only, we are the, my office is the project manager for the flagship LEAD program in Seattle and King County, but we also uh, created a national support bureau for that provides technical support for lead efforts around the country. Thanks for having me. Thank you, Lisa, and appreciate so much your being here. I remember the last time we met um, was by phone and pre-pandemic, so it's so nice to see your face, um, even under these uh, digital circumstances. Major Bayer, would you like to introduce yourself next? Uh, sure. Um, hello, everyone. I'm uh, Reed Bear. I'm currently serving as a deputy police chief for the city of Hickory Police Department here in Hickory, North Carolina. Uh, my role here uh, with the lead program is I am the department lead coordinator. And within our countywide program, which I'm sure we'll get to here in a little bit, um, I'm the, uh, I go out and do a lot of the uh, outreach and, and top, uh, topic discussions at various groups to tell them about LEAD, how it works, and why we're doing it. Um, why we got interested in LEAD is a, is a little bit of a, a story. We, we, we at the police department have been looking for a long time at that point, which was 2018, for a better way to serve our community with 
regards to drug addiction. Uh, we realized a long time ago that you cannot arrest your way out of an addiction problem. And we had been trying to think of ways to address it and to help those in our community suffering from substance abuse disorder. And we came across LEAD and started to, to read about it and study it. Uh, we did some traveling to uh, the LEAD site in Fayetteville, uh, as well as um, some calls to LEAD sites out West. And we felt like this was the best fit for our community. Uh, and we started in 2018, and uh, I think we've had a great deal of success, and I'm very happy to be here, and so thank you for having me. Thanks so much. Um, we really appreciate your joining the event. Charlton, would you like to introduce yourself? And you need to unmute the mic, please. Hi. Um my name is Charlton Robeson and I'm a certified drug and alcohol counselor as well as a qualified mental health professional. I'm also a peer with LEAD. I'm a peer support outreach worker. I have a shared experience. I have over 25 years of recovery under my belt. And um, you know what interests me in LEAD, I, I was uh, you know, as my, in my role as a, a mental health professional and a drug counselor, I worked closely with my predecessor with LEAD and I, you know, kind of salivated, you know, um, uh, you know, to be able to work with, you know, the population in that capacity because of the harm reduction uh, philosophy that was, you know, instituted with, um, with the LEAD program. I felt like it was the most effective way of reaching uh, you know, people with substance use disorder. So I'm, I was pleased to uh, come on, um, been working with uh, Lee for approximately a year and I'm, I'm loving it. And thank you for having me. That's wonderful. Thanks so much for being here. Um, it means a ton. Melissa, would you like to introduce yourself and then um, we can move along with our discussion topics. Yeah, sounds great. Thanks, Allison. I hope you can hear thank me you. okay. Yes. Okay, good. Glad to hear it. Um, well, my name is Melissa Larson. I am the Law Enforcement Programs Manager with the North Carolina Harm Reduction Coalition. Um, I have about 20 years public safety experience implementing um, a variety of law enforcement initiatives. And when I came to NCHRC about four and a half years ago, um, my role was to support the implementation and, and operation of LEAD programs. Um, that we're starting in North Carolina. And so with my experience, this has been one of the most rewarding programs that I've been involved in. Uh, one of the things that holds true with the LEAD program for um, ourselves as managers, but also officers engaged in the program is that you really get to see the outcomes of the work. Uh, there's not many law enforcement programs where you've got this direct connection to participants or the people that are working with them. And so to be able to see the impact of the work and the program is, can be very rewarding. So I'm very thankful to be here today and everyone on this panel, you know, plays a special role in supporting the law enforcement uh, lead programs around North Carolina. And so I really appreciate your continued support of it. So what we're gonna do today with our panel is we have some uh, questions for each of you. And if you, if you feel compelled to pop in at the end of a question, um, please feel free to. And then at the end, we'll have a Q&A session with our um, participants. So Lisa, I'm gonna start with you first. Um, the first question is uh, the LEAD model, as you know, operates within a harm reduction framework and is one of the guiding principles of the program. So can you describe this model for our participants and why so many communities across the nation have decided to implement this program? Absolutely, uh, and thanks for that question. Yes, when we, when we launched LEAD, the aim was to actually um, be more effective in resolving the, um, the issues that um, people, for example, that I represented who um, used drugs um, in ways that were very often harmful to themselves and harmful to other people. So the fact that, um, we were all urging that they not be um, jailed and prosecuted was not to diminish the real, um, the real problems that they were struggling with um, and the real challenges that those struggles inflicted on other people. 
So we were looking for the best methodology to actually engage people effectively, keep them engaged and make um, steady progress towards stabilization and recovery. And it turns out that somewhat counterintuitively um, a harm to many people, a harm reduction framework actually is the best way to um, facilitate and support steady transformation. And that that is especially true for people who have the least resources. So um, traditional strategies uh, that are abstinence-based that sort of frame up, you know, you, you're a success if you stop using drugs and if you relapse or continue on or sort of are in this gray space for a time, that's a failure. They intuitively make sense to people who see the harm of problematic drug use, um, but they are not typically very successful at maintaining engagement from people who have a long, steep climb. Um, oftentimes people are using drugs uh, in a problematic way, not in a recreational way, but in a problematic way. Um, as a result of um, years or decades of struggle and trauma that really doesn't have to do with drugs. Drugs are a coping mechanism to um, survive other problems and recognizing um, that stabilization and healing is gonna involve tackling those other problems is oftentimes how people gather the strength to reduce their drug use because the, the other issues that were driving that use are themselves getting um, attention and called forward and um, there's some problem solving going on with support. So the, the harm reduction movement has, the, the basic framework of harm reduction is that you meet people where they are, meaning you don't set any preconceived barriers of, you know, if you get to my office, I will work with you. Instead, we go out into the field. Um, if you, you know, meet certain sort of, you know, check the certain boxes, then you can get certain supports, rather um, sort of identify what's going on with people and start with the smallest of objectives or the smallest of goals, self-identified goals of that person. And as you build toward um, accomplishing those goals and people gather strength, they often um, times are able to self-identify that stepping away from harmful drug use is their own objective. Um, so I was gonna say the harm reduction movement um, has a couple of important precepts that I wanna call out. One is um, meet people where they're at, but don't leave them there. So it is not contrary to popular um, impression. It's not about um, you know validating that everything's going great. I mean, people generally know that everything is not going great. It's um, the fact that we are not judging or using shame and stigma about where people currently are does not mean that there's a, an affirmation um, that the status quo is, is good. Um, so meet people are where they're at, but don't leave them there. And secondly, um, one of the precepts of the harm reduction movement that gets very little attention, but to me is the most important is don't minimize the harm. The point of harm reduction is, you know, better is better, making slow progress is better than making no progress or people giving up. Um, but, when you're talking about reducing harm, the first point um, is to acknowledge that the harm is real and it's and to oneself, but also to other people. So you're beginning to um, form and value those connections and relationship um, and honor those, um, those relationships, which means um, sort of, uh, you know, building people, building up people's interest in and ability to um, be in a relationship of accountability and responsibility with other people. I hope that makes sense. We can go into it more in Q&A. Yeah, that was very helpful, Lisa. And when I was listening to your thoughts, it really made me think about the key stakeholders that are involved in the LEAD program. While it may be called law enforcement assisted diversion, it's not just a law enforcement program. And, you know, as, as Major Bear always says, it's a tool in the tool belt, right? Or in the toolbox. And so, um, there's so many other, you know, members of our team, such as Charlton, um, who provide peer support and that, and that outreach and engagement in a harm reduction philosophy and, and help them with those strategies. And so um, it's, I would say it's a very well-rounded um, partnership and collaboration between so many stakeholders. Um, so Major Barrett, the next question is for you. Your police department um, adopted and implemented the LEAD program in 2018. And as you mentioned earlier, it's grown into a countywide initiative. 
Can you describe why implementing pre-arrest diversion was important for your department and for your community and what your program looks like today? Sure. Uh, well, there were there were a lot of reasons uh, why it was important, and it goes to what you just said and, and what I always say, which is um, giving officers tools in their toolbox to be able to address problems in the community. And we were seeing, along with uh, all over the nation, cities all over the nation, uh, dramatic increase in overdoses and um, other things related to to drug abuse, and the traditional means of dealing with that, uh, they don't work. They, they're, you know, this is my 25th year as a, as a police officer uh, in the state of North Carolina. And so I've had my share of drug arrest, the training uh, years and years ago, and we needed something different. We needed to figure out a way to address the underlying issue of what was causing crime in the community, what was causing the overdoses in the community. How do we, how do we help the community? And so, the, the look to lead and why it was important for something that was pre-arrest diversion was because we could see this revolving door of you arrest a person for a drug offense, they may or may not uh, go to jail. Uh, and then the very next day, the same officer is out with the same person uh, having to deal with the same issue. And so we thought, I think the thought process was when we looked at lead was to see something that was pre-arrest uh, and offer that individual an alternative um, was had to be better than than what we have been seeing for so many years. Um, and we've been very fortunate, as I mentioned before, that, that we have seen that here in Catawba County uh, with our program. Um, the second part of your question, I think, was what does it look like today for us since 18? And it started off as a handful of agency in the DA's office, which uh, was actually a, a different DA at that time. Uh, we have been very fortunate that the um, the new DA has also been very supportive uh, and very interested in the LEAD program. Um, we started off as uh, several of the law enforcement agencies and some of our service providers here in Catawba County, uh, Catawba Behavioral Health and Partners Behavioral Health. And we are now, we've now grown to include the Sheriff's Department as well um, and uh, some other agencies. So we are almost every single law enforcement agency in the county is involved. And what that does is in our county, a lot of the individuals that we come in contact with as first responders uh, are the same across city limits and the same across if you're in the county or if you're in the city, it doesn't matter. And so by uh, having those relationships, uh, those tight knit relationships and good partnerships across the county, I think it puts us in a better position to help an individual who say maybe had an issue out in the county, uh, but then they had an issue in the city. So now there is a bi-weekly meeting where that individual's um, current situation is discussed between those agencies with the case manager there and the service providers there. And we can try to help develop a plan uh, to help this individual quicker than we could in the past. So it's really gotten to um, uh, a very uh, across the board level here, which has been uh, really nice to see uh, a lot of the folks come together in our partnerships. And it's a great working relationship we have here right now. Uh, probably the best it's ever been in, in my 25 years. So it works right now. It's working very well. And we're, uh, we're, we're really uh, very uh, proud of what we've been able to do so far. It's amazing what you can do when you bring your local stakeholders together. You're all working on the same issues. And um, I always say that the LEAD program provides that opportunity for, you know, the right people to come to the right table at the right time and really make an impact. Um, Charlton. Speaking about harm reduction and the guiding principle of the LEAD program sitting in a harm reduction foundation, can you tell us a little bit about your role and how you support the LEAD participants um, in maintaining that harm reduction fidelity? Yeah, um, and my role as a, a peer support in, uh, in the LEAD program is to, uh, you know, just support uh, the participants um, in the community, I, you know, I try to uh, solicit buy-in from them on the benefits that the program has for them. Um, and using the harm reduction philosophy, I, I assess the stage of change uh, that they're currently in and I kind of meet them where they are. I also provide them with options to change uh, if, they, um, if they want to while, minim while I try to minimize the uh, harm of their high-risk choices. Uh, 
This reinforces the model by keeping the goal of reduced criminal activity and access to treatment in the immediate view, in the immediate view of the participants. Um, the harm reduction model of this program recognizes that decreasing or stopping drug use can be complex for participants and they still may use drugs or participate in criminal activity, but that doesn't exclude them from participation in the program. Uh, I think that um, we see that uh, participants who are, you know, provided, you know, maybe the carrot of harm reduction, uh, they can kind of move along the continuum of change at, you know, at different rates and, you know, and I'm just there to support them where they are. Fantastic. Thank you, Charlton. Um, and keeping on our conversation about the, the founding principles of the LEAD program, Lisa, we've developed LEAD programs across the state of North Carolina. We have um, at least six active sites now, um, but we understand that every community is different, whether it's in North Carolina or uh, in Alabama or, or Chicago. Um, and so there's always going to be adaptations or departures, um, but we always want to maintain that fidelity to the model. So what does this look to, like across the nation and how have you seen communities embrace the adaptations but still prescribe to the model? Yeah, that is, um, that has been fascinating to watch. And of course, I do want to acknowledge that there are well over 80 communities in the country at this point who are in self-described lead initiatives embarked on, um, on at some point in that process. And no one is doing it at scale. So nobody has the, the resources to offer this approach to everybody um, for whom it might be um, appropriate. So we're still kind of in in process of scaling, Seattle King County might be the closest and we're not there, I can speak more about that. Um, but uh, we're also in different degrees of fidelity to those core principles. So I do wanna say um, sometimes when we are providing technical support to a community, they reach out to others around the country for tips and sometimes they're reaching out to truly brilliant practitioners who um, you know, are great guides to this work. And sometimes they're reaching out to people who are, um, who are uh, approaching this work not in fidelity to lead core concepts. So um, just observing that that's true. We don't, of course, we don't own these ideas, right? And, and people try what they think will work. We have found that um, real life just sort of eventually guides us all down <laughs> the same basic channel because what works works. And we've been in dialogue with communities uh, in various regions who start out with, I think, you know, with skepticism that they should, uh, they, they wanna um, focus, for example, on first offenders, people who are who are not um, deeply embedded in the criminal legal system don't have extensive criminal history. That's contrary to, to the lead core principle. It's meant to intervene with people who um, are otherwise frequently coming into contact with enforcement in the criminal legal system because um, these are people with often really entrenched challenges and who often pose entrenched challenges to their communities and for whom the standard um, approach is not effective and is not going to be effective. But um, when those, those communities that start out with this sort of first offender focus get a little bit down the road, they notice that they have other people who they don't have a good answer for and um, tend to then sort of expand and adapt the model and out in that direction. I will say, <clears throat> In recent years, five, five years ago, I um, was at the White House, probably with some of the people listening to this, um, and uh, in the last year of the Obama administration, there was a conference on LEAD, and I made a remark that I want to be held to, um, saying that if, if we were still at the front of a room defending the same or championing the same model in 10 years, um, you know, somebody should call us to account because this, this model is meant <clears throat> to be flexible and it's meant to provide a better response in the here and now with the configuration that each community has, <clears throat> but to always, to not get too, um, 
you know, sold on our current practices and current configuration, there's a great saying, um, fall in love with the problem and not with your solution. So our solution in Seattle King County that, that worked in 2011 is really no longer a super good fit for the reality of today. And so we're trying to practice our own principles of continued, um, uh, of continued development. <clears throat> so we are now starting to think about LEAD 1.0 as a model that um, took referrals from police who had people in custody who were otherwise going to jail or court. In our community, that is less and less happening. Police, for multiple reasons, mainly because law enforcement and the whole criminal legal system has accepted that that didn't make a lot of sense, has proven willing to shift um, upstream and allow a community-based response without police even coming into the picture um, and without certainly without people being taken into custody. So that has required us to build new referral channels if we waited for police to be involved, we'd be missing most of the problem and most of the crime that um, is related to drugs in our community. And we can take many of those referrals directly from community sources without burdening our police partners with having to respond and then hand people off to us. So that's been an important evolution. And the other thing I'll just say quickly is that when we started, the LEAD 1.0 model is case management. And that was a big step up from what had been offered to people in the past, a sustained relationship with somebody who wasn't time limited and was just gonna you know, work with them on whatever their issues were. But we didn't have housing for people. We didn't have a, um, access to a stable legal income source. And um, we've increasingly confronted the fact that we don't have, as much as it's better than what we used to do, that might not be the right question. We um, should really be asking, what do people actually need to stabilize and thrive? And so now we're trying to elevate our game, if you will, in terms of the resource toolkit that we have um, to put so that people are not out there on the street for six, seven, eight years on this very slow arc towards stabilization and trying to accelerate that a bit. Thank you, Lisa. It, it makes me think about no one size fits all and, and meeting everyone where they're at, whether it's the community, whether it's where law enforcement is, you know, and their feelings about harm reduction or the implementation of a program or, or maybe it's where our, the priorities of our participants are. And so there is a lot of flexibility within the LEAD program. And, but, you know, keeping the fidelity of the model in mind, I think it can definitely work within uh, the unique um, constraints of, of communities. And so, Major Bear, before you uh, implemented your program, you were doing a lot of community presentations and um, we're wondering how did that impact the design of your program and, and or how did you design your program to fit into what the community was telling you? So that, no, that's a great point. And to speak what, to what Lisa was talking about, our, we practice um, a community policing model here and have for 20 plus years. And what's interesting about our program is the community buy-in was instantaneous. There was a lot of excitement, but the um, social referral aspect of our program, I think even surprised us that over two thirds of our uh, clients in the LEAD program were social referrals and were not in custody or um, police calls for service interactions. Um, and I think that speaks to just what Lisa was talking about. It's evolving now to a, to a new model hours kind of did it on its own. And I think that's a great point, which is if, if you're on the call, if you're watching this and you're considering implementing something like this in your community to be a part of that, I think the lead programs, just like police departments are as different as the communities they serve. And to be able to um, customize that, if you will, for the needs of your community is, is extremely important. Where we were seeing, um, just like Lisa mentioned, you know, it's the interaction with police, the uh, pre-arrest diversion, but with two thirds of ours not even being a pre-arrest situation, um, I think that has also contributed a great deal to, to our uh, specific program. So it's uh, it's been really interesting to watch and see how, how it has come along just on its own. Thank you, uh, Major Bear. And just to clarify those social referrals, those are coming from law enforcement officers who have prior experience or engagement with someone that they know could benefit from the program. Is that correct? 
Yeah, that's exactly right. We, uh, our officers know a lot of the members in the neighborhoods, in the communities that they serve. We have permanent assignments on specific areas that officers work. So they may be aware that a, uh, a citizen that they have talked with uh, is having some issues or has a substance abuse issue and they tell them about the program. So there's not a, um, you know, there's not a negative interaction of someone has done something to break the law, which has caused the officer to get there. It's the officer is telling them, hey, I know you've been having some problems. Uh, we've got this program, can I tell you about it? And uh, that's, as I mentioned before, that's been the vast majority of our referral to this point. That's fantastic. And we're seeing that through a lot of our other lead sites too. Lisa, do you see that across the country? More social referrals than charge diversions? Always. We started with uh, you know, 80, 90% arrest diversions and it was really uh, um, police officers themselves who pointed out that it was not proactive enough to wait until they had probable cause. Um, and they, they knew, and the person knew that they knew, and they knew, anyway, I mean, it was, we could do a lot more um, earlier without um, reaching that adversarial, you know, posture. And of course that ended up having a transformative impact on the relationship of the community that used to get arrested a lot, began to see officers as a channel to um, assistance. Now, it doesn't make sense that you should have to go to officers as a channel for assistance, but um, they actually um, were some of the most um, solid relationships that people ended up being able to rely on in those early years. Now, though, um, we, uh, the Seattle Police Department has taken the position that unless um, there's sort of special circumstances, they are just as happy not even to be involved in that initial referral. However, they do have a lot of contact with folks. So knowing that the person is in lead allows them to reinforce and be aligned with um, the individual care plan that the person has. So no matter what the intake um, source, what the door is that people come in, um, having police um, coordination with this effort greatly improves the dynamics um, and uh, sort of make sure that the left hand and the right hand aren't working at cross purposes. Yeah, we, we moved from 80, 90% arrest referrals in the first couple of years to 92% social contact referrals um, over the last several years. That's great, thank you for sharing that. And, and the LEAVE program can, can work towards healing relationships too, some that you know, have been adversarial or negative in the past. So, which um, moves us along to addressing racial inequities. And so Lisa, there is a statement that was on the National um, Lead Support Bureau's website. And so I just wanna read that out and then I have a question for you. Um, and it reads, the movement for Black Lives has created an opportunity to radically rethink how American communities pursue public health, order, safety, and equity. The call to dismantle our nation's over-reliance on policing and the legal system has moved from the progressive edge to the center of public policy debates in many communities. And then it discusses in order to uh, meet this transformative movement, the flagship lead program in Seattle is now known as law enforcement assisted diversion, but also let everyone advance with dignity. And you've developed a new um, option for lead operations that decenters law enforcement as gatekeepers to lead services, yet still retaining traditional lead for jurisdictions in which it represents a meaningful shift. Um, so the question is, can you talk about briefly this reinvigorated community to addressing racial inequities and how lead sites can address these inequities? Honestly, um, lead at every point along that continuum can be a mechanism for addressing those, um, those inequities. Um, there's so much to be said about this. The, um, you know, law enforcement did not ask to be assigned this job. As a society, as a, as a nation, we have left police as the primary um, responders to complex problems um, that they, you know, we have found nationally police to be very welcoming of um, allies <laughs> in that response, you know, others to come out, others to stay, people to take on board the, um, the, uh, the work of supporting people in between their contacts with police. Um, it hasn't been law enforcement that's been resistant to that, um, to that shift or that model. And it's also true that um, we've seen law enforcement support for the concept that the more 
um, community needs can be responded to with community resources and the fewer people have to be routed through the emergency response system, whether it's 911, 988, um, or any sort of point of crisis response, uh, the better. So I think this is what's been important for us, right? And I alluded to this earlier, is to maintain the flexibility in the model so that we are um, helping the um, lead partner, the lead partnership helps officers when they are still, because of the, the dynamics in their particular community, they are still the ones where there, there's a public expectation of enforcement. They are expected to go, they are sent, they are there, they need other tools. So that's lead 1.0 and it can be um, an important strategy in advancing racial equity in, a, in any community where that enforcement response has fallen disproportionately on um, people of color, which is most communities in our country. And yet, um, just because we built it that way doesn't mean that any of us, including police, have to dig in and be like, well, it has to be, that's the best way to respond to drug issues. We only designed LEAD because there was already this distortion that we built a system where police were the people called to respond to what is fundamentally an issue of emotional, psychological, and physical health. And that never made a great deal of sense. And it is also not something that law enforcement designed. So as we unravel that, um, it is it takes nothing away from the um, contribution that police officers have made all around this country in rethinking the approach that we should take to understand that um, well, the ultimate sort of redesign of all of this probably will have police more at the margins of the response and other systems that have just um, you know, profoundly failed to engage and respond to the needs of this population being held accountable to step forward. Great, thank you, Lisa. Um, Allison, I, I know we're getting a lot of really good questions coming into um, the chat. And so I wanna make sure that we yeah. have for that. Um, is it okay for me to skip around on questions? with our time that we have left? Sure. Okay, great. Um, Charlton. Charlton, are you with us? Yes, I am. Uh, I think they have my video muted. Um, they said the um, moderator has my video mu muted. Okay, just wanted to uh, see if you were with us. So let's talk about um, engagement with our lead participants. Uh, so the process of engaging with lead participants after referral and then sustaining their level of engagement. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges and successes that you've had? Okay, the host has my video disabled, so. We can hear you though. Okay. We'll work on that. Okay. Um, yeah, so, um, you know, there are many challenges that uh, people with substance use, use disorders have um, faced during, the, you know, this pandemic. Um, one of them, uh, one of the uh, main uh, challenges they've had uh, is financial. Um, you know, there have been uh, reduced ways that they could, you know, legally um, support their drug habit, like for instance, going to work. Many jobs have been, you know, downsized or eliminated. Uh, so they've um, not had those that, that uh, as a resource. Um, socially, um, you know, uh, many of the treatment programs have reduced um, or have become, you know, ineffective in that they, you know, providers have elected to go uh, virtual um, uh, or some of them have um, elected to um, cease um, operations. Uh, people with substance use disorder, they already um, feel isolated and now they're being uh, further isolated um, because of some of the restrictions during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic and also with some of the, uh, you know, the fears, especially in the early stages of the pandemic, uh, their social supports kind of distanced themselves because of their high risk uh, behaviors, uh, their uh, natural supports, you know, kind of, you know, maybe kept them at bay. So um, it was very important for you know, me as a, a, a peer support specialist and, and a lead um, harm reductionist to be out there with them, giving them support uh, uh, to, um, you know, educate them, you know, um, on the, some of the substances that, that they, was, they, they have been using, like for instance, um, you know, uh, drugs like heroin and cocaine 
you know, there's been limited supply, you know, during the pandemic, uh, many people have chosen to turn to drugs like fentanyl and methamphetamine. Uh, so, you know, I educate them, I give them psychoeducation on, you know, the effects of those drugs and, you know, and, and so that they can be informed. Um, also support them by assisting them with linkage to, you know, some of the uh, scarce uh, resources that are still available and providing them with, um, you know, that interpersonal connection. I think that that's the most important letting them know that they're not alone out there, that, you know, people still care. And I also educate them about how the courts and the law enforcement, uh, you know, are, you know, attempting to help them and society by proxy, by, you know, um, you know, engaging them with these um, different, you know, our whole continuum of care with the LEAD program. So uh, those are some of the um, ways that, you know, I. I and the LEAD program and harm reduction kind of support these uh, individuals during the pandemic. Yes, it's been very um, difficult with, with participants level of engagement uh, during that feeling of isolation from COVID and just generally speaking outside of that environment, uh, something that's unique about the LEAD program is that there's no end date. You know, we're always here to support the participants. Um, there's no graduation date. If they opt not to engage for a, a specific period of time, whether it's four weeks or four months or, or eight months or two years, uh, we are still here to support them at whatever level they're, they're you know, interested in. And so um, that maintaining level of engagement is the role of the peer support and the case manager, and um, it's very supportive. Um, Major Bear, I have the last formal question for you, and it's just shifting to um, the judicial system in general. And so operating a pre-arrest diversion program starts with getting the district attorney to sign off on the creation of the program and then the eligibility criteria, especially as it pertains to charge diversions. Um, and so we also want the DA to understand that this response is about shifting into a behavioral health model from a criminal justice model. And so can you describe this shift within the criminal justice system uh, from the standpoint of both law enforcement and prosecutors and how um, easy or how complex it was to embrace this new concept? Sure. Uh, I think that here, uh, speaking for here in, in Catawba County, I, I, it really wasn't it really wasn't terribly difficult. The, for a long time, we've been looking, as I mentioned before, we've been looking for ways to serve the community better and realizing that the traditional means weren't working. So I think the shift, um, there were already some things in place, even with our district attorney's office, different kinds of courts that they had set up in order to try not to be as punitive and to try to divert folks into treatment um, before lead even. So, I think the foundation was already there. And when we were able to come together, the key for us is, is partnerships. And I can't stress that enough. When you have partnerships uh, within your community that you can pick up the phone or just go and meet with your DA. And I'm talking about the DAs and the law enforcement agencies and the uh, service providers, the mental health and addiction services and, and other services. You know, we're, we're very fortunate here in Catawba County that we have that. And so I'm not gonna say it was easy, it was a lot of work, but I think everyone came to the table with the mindset that something needed to change. Um, this, this was a very appealing model uh, in order to try to help individuals who were struggling uh, that did not need to go through the criminal justice system. So, um, you know, it was already here. And so that shift just wasn't, um, I, think it's, I think it's been shifting slightly and slowly opposed to just a one dramatic shift, if that answers your question at all. Absolutely, and some of our sites were seeing even more law enforcement uh, discretion being used as to whether or not they're gonna pursue charges just for possession or any low level drug offense. And so that is the, the, the eligibility or the premise of the LEAD program is to divert individuals low level drug offenses into this model. Oh, I think I'm starting to echo. Um, and so it's been it's been very insightful to see district attorneys uh, sign off on this policy and, and the eligibility criteria. So, um, Allison, you have some questions from the audience, I believe. 
I do. Uh, let's see here. Okay, so this, uh, the first question is for Major Bayer. Did the LEAD program begin with the Hickory PD and move out to the county? Uh, so it, it began the, in the initial stages. It was the Hickory Police Department. We found it, we studied it, and we approached some other agencies in our county, the Newton Police Department, Conover Police Department, Maiden, Claremont, uh, and the District Attorney's Office, and then the service providers were the very first. Later on, uh, Catawba County Sheriff's Department came on board, and then our new district attorney just continued uh, their participation. I see, great, thank you. And um, a question, I guess, to follow on to, to that, um, that occurs to me is, um, must uh, the person be a county resident to be eligible for lead services within Catawba County? Uh, for our program to participate in our program, you need to be a county resident, yes. But mm -hmm. we do, and that was one of the challenges early on is we do have a lot of individuals coming into our county from bordering counties. Right. So our practice has been now to connect those individuals. It's not, we just don't tell folks, I'm sorry, you're not eligible. Um, we now reach out to the county where they reside and connect them to a service. They may not have a lead program, but we try to connect them to a service provider um, in that respect. Just And the reason we do that is our case manager, it's very difficult for our case manager to travel to go uh, help folks in other counties and when they have such a caseload here, obviously. Thank you. Uh, the next question, Lisa, maybe this would be a good uh, question for you to respond, but certainly anybody um, on the panel is welcome to chime in. Uh, how does harm reduction model jive with probation and drug testing procedures? Yep, I've been typing away in the chat, um, trying to hit as many questions as possible, The um, and I just did that one. So we, a, a core principle of LEAD um, in the harm reduction framework is it's not abstinence-based, and so therefore we're not, we're not testing people, nor frankly do case managers need to, to drug test people. <laughs> there, there are other indicators of use. So um, if that relationship is working well, it's evident um, that, that folks are using. Um, so that's not a, that's not a barrier or requirement. Um, and if it was, it wouldn't be a lead program. That said, um, lead is fundamentally reality-based. There are many abstinence-based, I mean, however ill-designed and we would prefer that those systems not require abstinence, but um, the truth is that many of the people diverted to lead, lead's not um, like people are not just the transaction, right? If there was this one case that didn't get filed and instead the person got diverted to lead. Many, if not most people using drugs who don't have a ton of resources are typically engaged in an array of other illegal activity. And so they're often engaged in um, situations that are gonna result in not non-diverted cases um, or divertible, but not diverted or not divertible. And so they are gonna be in court. They are going to be in probation departments and those are typically not working from a harm reduction framework, although that is changing in some communities around the country. So um, lead case managers, the art form, I don't know if Charlton can you know, speak to this, but the art form is to be like, it's not a requirement for the relationship with me that you not be using drugs, but you are still dealing with, you know, you're in clean and sober housing. So how are we going to like make that work out, right? Um, or you're, you are being drug tested in probation and how are we going to get that to work out? So um, if the person fails, right, that, that requirement that's been imposed by an external entity, the case manager is gonna be supporting the person in like the objectively negative consequences of that, but also the felt, you know, the impact of having failed. It's so, that can be really a big setback for people. Um, and we're just real about that, that there are those systems that are not approaching the situation with the um, values framework that we apply and people have to be supported to survive in that world. Um, Allison, I'm gonna, this is Melissa, the host. I'm gonna jump in really quick. Um, sure. Carlton, we can't actually um, access your video. It, could you push your video button? 
Yeah, it's it's just saying uh, you cannot start your video because the host is, has disabled it. And every time I push it. Okay, try one more time. Yeah, that it's giving me that same. Oh, it's giving you the same message. Okay. Okay, I'm sorry. I um. We haven't. We don't. I keep trying to turn it on, and it won't give us access. So oh, there we go. Oh, there okay. you go. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Sorry to interrupt everyone. I just Thanks, wanted to Melissa. follow up on that probation piece. What was interesting, and going back to flexibility, um, when we developed policies in some of the sites, um, there was no probation at all as far as eligibility goes. And the officers came back and they said, look, we feel like there's a lot of individuals on probation that we would like to refer to this program. And so the decision was made to change the policy that, okay, it, general or unsupervised probation was, was fine. Um, and so that has really opened the doors to make more referrals. And, and, and again, about the partnerships, our case managers, some of them are housed within um, buildings that also have probation officers. And so they develop a partnership and when they're quote unquote sharing the same participant who happens to be a lead client, but also on probation, you've seen some good conversations happen to say, look, this person is doing so well within the lead program. And yes, they may not be meeting your compliance criteria on probation, but what can we do to really move this person forward and not, not allow this step back, which would be detrimental to their progress. And so those partnerships with probation um, are flexible or can be flexible and they can be very helpful to the participant. Great, thank you. Yeah, can, can I speak to that for a moment? Because um, that's very Please. true. That's very true what Melissa said. Um, you, know, um, you know, as a uh, support out in the community, we kind of, you know, are able to accentuate the positive aspects of the person's progress where you know, the probation officer or, you know, they may not be able to see that, you know, um, you know, from their, you know, continue to use or test positive during drug screens, but we can kind of, you know, say, hey, this person is, um, you know, they're showing more responsibility in certain, you know, different areas of their life. Uh, they are, um, you know, uh, one of the things that, you know, moving a person uh, along the continuum of changes when we are like, for instance, when we're giving them, when we're doing syringe exchange, you know, a person has been, may have been doing uh, high risk and destructive behaviors, but now they're taking more precaution in their drug use. Sometimes that, that can be the catalyst for them to want to change further. They're using clean syringes and their, you know, their, um, their works are, uh, you know, they're taking better care of their works. They're being responsible and turning their old dirty syringes in. So that's a, that's a level of responsibility that, you know, I always, you know, um, praise them for. And I've seen, you know, you know, a sparkle in some people's eyes when they do those kind of things. They'd be like, okay, thanks. Yeah, I'm, I am doing better. And then, you know, they start to inquire about other uh, ways that they can change. And that's when I can get in there and, and say, hey, you know, we have this program, we have that program. And you know, and we've seen that. And, and and to accentuate what Melissa said, that's why we always stay engaged, no matter uh, the complexity of their condition, we stay engaged with um, with the participants. I've had, I've just had a participant that was disengaged for almost two years, but now she's reemerged and she's wow. starting to address um, some of the underlying issues of why she was homeless and why she was actively using, she's addressing her mental health issues now. So we're hopeful that that would spur her on to, you know, make further progress, so. That's wonderful, thank you. Um, if, and, and for the panelists, we're able to go until 1.45 if you're available. If not, we, you know, certainly understand, but uh, we've got several other questions um, that I'd love to get it answered. Does that work for you all? I can stay for a few more minutes, yes. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, the next question, Officer Bell here with NCDPS State Probation Parole in Robeson County. Any suggestion on how the lead model can and will be effective in an extremely low income community where many resources are limited but drug use is high? Mm -hmm. Housing, transportation, income, treatment, et cetera. 
what suggestions do you have for us that are trying to assist in these counties slash communities slash courts, et cetera? And I will, I guess, add to that, that, you know, for North Carolina is one of the states that has not expanded Medicaid. And my guess is that a lot of lead eligible people would be eligible for Medicaid if we were an expansion state and that that would give them, you know, much better access to services. Um, so that's just in that context also. I think I'll take that first. Um, that's a difficult question. There are a lot of communities around North Carolina who, who really struggle with access to services and, and having what, what would we would think for a LEAD program would be a basic foundation. Not everyone's gonna have a detox center in their community and we understand that. Um, but it's really about uh, um, completing a community assessment to figure out what do we have and how can we best use those resources? And part of our lead sites in North Carolina, um, one of our key stakeholders is our MCO, the LME, whether it's Alliance or Trillium or Partners or VIA or Sandhills, really connecting with them to figure out what resources do we have in this community. And I do know, Cassandra, that um, Roberson is one of those communities that is on the top of the list for NCHRC to really try to get some harm reduction services in it because Charlton can attest that we've had lead participants um, from the Cumberland area say hey you know I, I why they're not participants per se but they've come into contact and said I live in Roberson and I would love to be able to come to Fayetteville to you utilize those resources but transportation is always going to be a barrier for most people um, and so it's really about trying to figure out what resources already exist and how can we utilize those um, I wish that there was a money tree in the backyard or an, a magic eight ball to say, hey, this is how we get all these resources together. But that would be my suggestion um, as a first step. Great, thanks, Melissa. Um, I guess a related question that followed, does the program charge a fee? If so, how do people who don't have the ability to pay access programs? No fee, I, at least. There shouldn't be. I don't know if there are any exceptions to that in North Carolina. Um, yeah, uh, that would be a, one of the one of the barriers that that we would not impose. Um, just to chime in on the last question, Officer Bell generated a number of fantastic questions, which um, we've been chatting about in the chat. But this question about um, you know a, a sort of service desert areas where um, there are so few resources. Uh, so this is where you can get the benefit of, um, you know, learning from other people's mistakes too. Uh, even even in comparatively more resourced communities, the the individuals who have been drawn into the criminal legal system related to drugs tend to be from pockets of very under resourced communities in those wealthier environments. Um, and so the the bottom line is that the kind of investment in the in the um, the resources that that person has access to that would really be needed for that individual to thrive um, are much more significant than we offered in LEAD 1.0. And so um, when we first started, you know, the enthusiasm for the paradigm shift was rapid and very widespread. And there was a lot of, you know, well, let's, if I add in another $100,000, can you serve this whole new neighborhood? And we tended to say yes, because it felt terrible to say no, <laughs> you know, when, when there were willing partners, but it was always lowballed in terms of the resources offered. And as a result, we ended up sort of spreading the theory of lead engagement very thin across a very deep reality of human suffering and need. And so um, people would be in lead, but realistically speaking, we weren't, what could we do other than go out and sort of cheerlead while they like lived in a tent on the, you know, in a park. It's um, the fact that we're just not pulling people into the legal system and providing um, outreach based field based relationship is fantastic. But if we don't have a strategy around income, we don't have a strategy around housing. Um, how much is that person's situation really going to change? So now, like, having a little bit, we we configured our work. We're saying take whatever resources you've got and um, invest appropriately in a smaller participant population so that the model, the power of the model becomes clear. That then becomes a motivator 
for public officials and the community to rally around it and say, we want more of that. It is so obviously effective. It's really quite beautiful what happens rather um, than saying it could be beautiful. You know, we need to actually show that. And um, so I think a deeper concentration with a smaller number of people with whatever resources you can tap into um, makes sense. And there are lead um, earmarked funding streams, federal funding streams um, to apply for. So apply, take that money and divide it up over a smaller number of people to start. That's my recommendation. Super, thank you. And I think one last question uh, we have, um, and this is directed to you also, Lisa, um, but certainly Major Bayer and Charlton, you're welcome to uh, respond to. Can you speak more about the perspective of looking through harm reductionist lens in regards to the medical definition of addiction? The proponents of abstinence-based and harm reduction approaches often seem to view the approaches as in opposition. There seem to be benefits and limitations to both as we strive toward person-centered care. Do you see them as mutually exclusive? I'm probably not the, honestly, this is not my um, area of expertise. And I will just concur with that, with the point that the, the false dichotomy, right? That um, many people who are engaged through a harm reduction front door, base front door, do tap into um, standard recovery strategies. They do find them useful. And um, harm reduction is not to the contrary. I mean, harm reduction is about making available to people what works for them. Um, it's, however, about not leaving people behind and um, seeing folks who have not, um, you know, stepped onto that road or stayed on that road, not um, as, as people who have not uh, gotten there yet, kind of, you know. Um, and so I, I agree about the false dichotomy being um, un, unhelpful, but Charlton and, and Melissa probably um, are more the experts in this area. Yeah, uh, you know, I think that the most, you know, forums like this, when we, um, you know, when we talk about harm reduction uh, and its impact, you know, in on our community, because I live and work in the communities where I, where I, you know, where I work at, you know, uh, so uh, I think that, you know, being able to educate and, you know, and kind of attack some of the stigma around harm reduction and, and, and kind of accentuate the benefits that it has for the communities, I think, you know, that's, you know, that's a chore. That's the chore that we have in front of us. And I, you know, I personally, I take on that uh, challenge every time I can talk to someone, they'd be like, why are you out there giving out needles and stuff like that? And, you know, and I'll be able to, you know, tell them about the benefits that it has, you know, in, on, on, you know, for the community at large and for the individuals that, that I'm serving. Uh, so, you know, that's, you know, we have, we have a big chore in kind of destigmatizing the whole harm reduction and MAT approach to uh, a substance use disorder. And Allison, I'll just add that in, in, in my experience, I think at least in this community, there's a place for both. Uh, it's just, uh, you know, I'll be, you know, beating a drum over and over when I say tools in your toolbox, but abstinence programs work for some members of the community and some they don't. Harm reduction approaches work for some members of the community and some they don't. And we need as many tools as we can, can get in order to try to, uh, to help folks. Very good, thank you. Melissa, did you wanna add anything? I think we're just about out of time. Um, no, but if you don't mind, there's a couple of things in the chat I just wanted to bring attention to. Um, one sure. is, can a participant save the chat? I know a, a host can click on the three little dots at the end to save chat. Um, if somebody could put in there some instruction on that, that would be great. There's a lot of good information in there. And then just real quickly, Major Bear, would you mind just giving a, a, a quick lowdown on how you created officer buy-in? Sure. Um, so you know, the, a big part of the rollout here was to make sure that you don't adopt a program that no one is going to believe in or no one's going to use. And so 
the uh, the officer buy in here, we were we're very fortunate to have a, a mindset in most of our officers that they want as many uh, tools again to use as they can when they encounter. There's nothing more frustrating for an officer to go to a problem and stand there and say, "I just I don't have any way to handle this." And so, in order to create that mindset that this that lead was something you can use to help the individuals that you encounter where there is no law enforcement tool. We tell everyone here that, you know, if you're gonna build a house and you only use a hammer, you're gonna build a very um, shoddy house, but you need all the tools you can, to, can have and to make something that's gonna be sustainable and it's gonna put a foundation down that's gonna be something you can build on. So that's that was the approach we took and, and our officers embraced it. and. Uh, you know, we still we have officers that use lead more than other officers. I think that's universal at any department. Uh, we have officers ranging in age from 21 to you know 55, um, and from all different parts of the community. So, uh, but overall, I think everyone uh, involved in our program at every agency, not just Hickory PD, um, we've had buy-in from all the agencies, and we've had referrals from all the agencies. And so that that was a very that was a key component. Uh, and we actually brought in, um, at the time, our case manager had a personal story that was uh, very, it was riveting, it was real, it was genuine. And so he presented that personal story about uh, substance abuse in his family that I think made it just, um, made it very genuine. And that, that, was a, that was a big plus. But it's very important, the officer buy-in is you have to have. Thank you. Great, well, I think, um... We are now out of time. I wanted to just thank you, the three of you again, so, so much uh, for taking your time um, to have this event with us. And thank you all to attendees as well. It's wonderful to see so many people on here um, and so much uh, enthusiasm and interest for lead programming um, and others, other programs that are like it. So thanks again. It was a great conversation and great questions. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you as well.